time to get started anyway. So um, welcome everyone to um, the first in this year's BBI webinars. Um, we're really fortunate today to be joined by um, Kirsten Gottfried, and I hope my, pronoun my German pronunciation is good enough there. <laughs> Um, I'm the way also, I like to hear it. <laughs> good, good, I, I try my best. Um, and I'm also joined by uh, Professor Steve Mann, who's going to be helping uh, field some of the questions later to, to Kirsten. Um, in terms of some of the logistics, so the, the way that this seminar works is we'll, Kirsten will talk for about 40 minutes. And um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask her, um, you can post those throughout the talk and at the end of the talk through a platform called Slido. So I'm going to quickly post into the, um, the chat the link to, to the Slido uh, website, or you can just search on Google, Google for Slido. And then there's a, a number that you'll have to put in for this specific meeting, which is 707120. And then you'll be able to post your questions. You can upvote questions that you'd like asked. And me and Steve will do our best to try and ask those in a, a logical format or combine them where necessary. Um, okay, so I think that's all of the logistics side of things. So it just, it just, um, it's just my chance now to actually introduce uh, Kirsten, which is a real pleasure. So Kirsten originally started her academic career with a PhD from the University of Cambridge as one of the Gates Cambridge Fellows. And she worked with Ulrich uh, Kaiser uh, on DNA origami of, of nanopores. So there's a, there's a DNA theme already emerging in some of her work. She then went on to um, take up a, a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship at one of the MPIs for Intelligent Systems in Stuttgart and worked with Joachim Spatz on more bottom-up type synthetic biology type work. So I guess we'll find out, I guess, in the talk, but that's where some of the, this kind of synthetic biology side of things and kind of creating life from scratch sort of started to kick things off. And a lot, a lot of our work there was focused on microfluidics. So it was a slightly different I guess, flavor of the sorts of work that she'd been doing before. Uh, and then in 2019, she uh, established her own uh, independent Max Planck research group, at, uh, which is called the Biophysical Engineering of Life, um, which is based at the uh, MPI for Medical Research in, in Heidelberg. Um, and she's really been doing over the last few years some really beautiful work in, I think, combining kind of microfluidics, DNA origami, and all sorts of other types of of synthetic biology together, um, which, we'll, which we'll get to hear about. And the other thing I wanted to highlight is that Kirsten also does a lot of um, kind of outreach in science communication. So you might turn on the TV one day and actually see her telling you about some of the, the weird and wonderful science she's doing. So um, we're, we're really fortunate to have her here today. And with that, I'll hand over to, uh, to Kirsten, who's going to be telling us about DNA nanotechnology, a shortcut to synthetic cells. Thank you very, very much, Thomas, uh, for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, it's, really, it's really a pleasure to talk to you. I always take up every opportunity to actually come to the UK because, as you can imagine, it's, I've had a wonderful time over there and, and, and I really miss it a lot. So at least virtually, it's great to be with you and uh, to, de to get the chance to discuss uh, with many of you uh, later on as well. Um, so yeah, um, I will I will I will start with with my talk right now, uh, which is on on uh, synthetic biology. Basically, the scientific question that that uh, really puzzles me is the question whether it may be possible to build a cell from from scratch and uh, from from a priori non living materials. And I mean, there's an entire scientific field that has emerged around this question, which is bottom up synthetic biology, where uh, biomolecules are isolated from cells and then reconstituted, recombined in order to one day be able to create a synthetic cell or a transition from matter to life in the laboratory. And now, as you can imagine, uh, this is this is super hard. And because it is so hard, maybe if we look at history, we realize that abstraction could actually help us, that we might think about using new tools and new materials uh, for building synthetic cells. And this is what kind of motivates my approach to synthetic biology, where instead of using biomolecules from cells, we actually make our own synthetic building blocks and program their assembly to make synthetic cells, which may look a bit different from life as we know it, but have the same basic functionality. So rather, so really focus on, on function rather than on molecular detail. Because if you think about it, recombining the pieces of the puzzle can be really, really hard. But if you're open to use new tools, 
And new materials, you may actually be quicker at arriving with something with the same functionality. So, so this is really where this idea emerges from to, to use DNA nanotechnology as a, as a, as a shortcut towards creating synthetic cells. And of course, then you have to ask yourself what tools and which materials could be useful to actually make synthetic cells. And I, I hinted it in my title that, that DNA nanotechnology is one of them, but actually there are other, others. So DNA nanotechnology, first of all, for us is a tool to make components for synthetic cells which we can then integrate into compartments and also analyze with microfluidics. And then kind of our latest addition to, the, to our toolbox for making synthetic cells is laser printing, because this really gives us a way of arranging components once they are encapsulated inside a compartment. So part of my group is focusing here on the development of new tools and new materials for synthetic cells. We are then taking these tools and pass them forward to actually make components and functions for synthetic cells. And um, since we can see these synth synthetic cells really as model systems also, um, and kind of a simplified versions of living cells, this gives us a handle to really test components also for living cells. So all the components that we've created and verified inside synthetic cellular compartments, so lipid vesicles, we can then actually take and repurpose for as tools for uh, molecular biology and this is what you can what you can see here so really my group is, is built up or divided up into these three pillars so to say um, and in this talk today i would like to actually focus on on some very new work which is not published yet on uh, on a new tool that i find very exciting for, for uh, making synthetic cells. And then I will talk about DNA nanotechnology as the core of our work uh, and some I show you some components that we've built from DNA uh, for synthetic cells. And then I'll move on to talk about one function which may seem crucial towards uh, realizing uh, synthetic cells. Um, so let's start with, with laser printing. So um, wh why laser printing? I mean, um, so first of all, one quickly realizes that once you have a compartment and you have components enclosed inside these compartments, it is actually quite challenging to arrange them in space and time. And if we look at living cells, then we, then we know that their interior is highly crowded, but also highly organized. And this um, gave me the idea to say, okay, can we actually encapsulate a photoresist inside of a lipid vesicle so that we can then use laser printing, two photon uh, 3D laser printing to simply write structures inside of this, uh, of this lipid vesicle. And I presented this idea um, about, about two years ago, ago as a conceptual idea and, and uh, people were very, very critical, were very concerned about the stability of the lipid membranes and so on. So we actually had to go and, and do it. Um, so first of all, um, we had to encapsulate the photoresist inside of the lipid vesicle. So here you can see a lipid vesicle. Um, and then um, we, uh, we, we need a water-based photoresist. And we chose actually a photoresist composed of PEC-DA and LAP. So very, very conventional. PEC-DA is the resist component. LAP is actually the photo initiator, um, which, is, uh, which, uh, which polymerizes the, the, uh, the PEC-DA up on, up on illumination uh, with uh, UV light. And uh, then in order to get these resist components inside of the lipid vesicle, we realized that we can actually rely on passive diffusion. So here you can see a fluorescently labeled um, resist component, which we added just for visualization purposes. And you can see that once you add it to the vesicles, it is uh, diffusing to the inside of the vesicle and eventually the concentrations inside and outside are equilibrated. Uh, and you can track now the, the influx of this resist component into the vesicle. And you see that after, after, um, after about an hour or so, you, uh, you reach quite good uh, encapsulation. The nice thing about the, fa the fact that we realize on diffusion, that, that we uh, rely on diffusion here is that we can actually develop the structures after the printing process in principle. So basically we have a way to get rid of the excess resist components simply by diluting the lipid vesicles after uh, the encapsulation. Here you see we did lots of work to characterize also the influx of the other resist components like LAP and PEC-DA, so the non-fluorescent ones, um, and um, all of them really get into the vesicle. Um, so this is the first step. 
the next step is obviously the proof of principle, so the, the, the printing itself. So we use 3D2 photo and 3D laser printing to write, as you can see here, 3D structures into the lipid vesicles and, and also here like 2D, um, 2D shapes, which, you, which really shows you that you have quite good spatial control over, over the printing and that it really happens inside of the lipid vesicle and the lipid vesicle remains intact throughout the throughout the process. And we did quite a lot of work to confirm that the membrane really remains intact. So basically that, uh, that there is no oxidation taking place because the, the, uh, the free radicals that are produced in this two photon polymerization process are consumed very locally. So, so the lipids really remain intact, the vesicles remain intact and we can print on the inside of them. And now if we zoom into one of these printed structures, um, here with AFM, then you can actually see um, that um, you can actually see that the, 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 the printed structures are porous. So what we've printed a hydrogel here, and um, they're nanoporous. And this nanoporosity of these hydrogels gave us a first idea um, for an application. So we thought, okay, since, the, since these hydrogels are nanoporous, can we actually use it as a first application and print a pore? So um, why, why is that interesting? Because um, we, uh, of course, if you want to get components on, uh, to the inside of, of synthetic cells that are enclosed by a lipid membrane, then you need a pore. And of course, it's possible to reconstitute protein pores inside of the membrane of, of lipid vesicles. But if you look at some of the larger macromolecules, like for instance, single-stranded DNA, it's actually quite hard to find natural pores which are large enough to transport uh, such components and they are quite difficult to reconstitute. So we thought maybe this can actually address a real world challenge, so to say, in synthetic biology. And at the same time, of course, another advantage compared to natural protein pores would be that you could basically induce with light when, at what time point, the pore is forming. So we tried this and you can see here a confocal image of two lipid ves vesicles adjacent to one another. Um, in this one, we didn't print a pore, so the single-stranded DNA, which is diluted in the background and, and labeled in a, with a green dye, cannot penetrate into the lipid vesicle. But once we printed a pore in this vesicle, um, you can see the pore here in the XZ plane, then um, the, the, um, we, we are creating a passage for single-stranded DNA and the single-stranded DNA can flow into, on the inside of the, of the lipid vesicle across this uh, nanoporous structure here. Um, and, and again, it's, it's really intriguing to see that the vesicle remains intact throughout the process. We believe that the mechanism for pore formation is, is, um, is kind of like we are, we are, locally, we are locally creating um, free, free radicals here, which may induce like local oxidation of the lipids and therefore like provide, uh, provide a passage for, uh, uh, it, it enable the polymerization process here locally. Um, we can track the influx of the components on the inside of the uh, as they as they move into the vesicle, and so this is a quite uh, quite a reproducible um, process here, the, the printing. But this, of course, is just a very like say preliminary or very first application of of printing uh, inside of lipid vesicles. So um, of course, if you think about it, like any application in the context of synthetic biology that I can think of at least uh, would require like stimuli responsive resist that would, would could change of kind of change conformation or, or do something up on up on stimulation and uh, this really brings me to my next topic because um, if it comes to stimuli responsiveness I think DNA nanotechnology is the best is one of the one of the really nice tools that we that we have at hand um, so Basically, first of all, what is, what is DNA nanotechnology? DNA nanotechnology is really about repurposing DNA as a construction material based on the complementary base pairing of DNA. So it's not about genetics, it's really about using DNA merely for, for construction, for, for, uh, for architecture, so to say. Um, now, if you think about it, if you take a, a double strand of DNA, and you extend a single strand of DNA here, say uh, on one end of the of the duplex, and then another single strand on the other other end. Then you'd have an attachment uh, site for a third strand of DNA, which could bind over here. And in this way, you can create of these you can create these kind of three armed uh, three armed branch structures. Now, if you extend single stranded DNA overhangs on 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 uh, each side of these uh, of these 
DNA nano stars, so to say, and you make them self complementary, then you can basically um, create a larger, larger architectures, so you can create a DNA based hydrogel. Um, and you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, this gives you a handle to actually also make, uh, to use DNA kind of as a photoresist. So what have we done here? We have basically in the red section here, in the red part of the, of the DNA sequence, we have included a photocleavable site, which allows us to actually print and erase these DNA-based hydrogens. So what you see here in yellow is really just, is really just DNA um, and uh, for, form, formed, uh, forming a porous hydrogel over here. And then you can use, in this case, we just use a confocal microscope, a confocal, the laser from a confocal microscope to erase custom structures like the letters DNA over here, um, or here again on the inside of a lipid vesicle, uh, where we basically encapsulated the, the DNA strands, formed this hydrogel, and then erased with a resolution of, of, of sub-micrometer. So this, uh, this really works across scales. So here you see almost on a millimeter scale, we can form a hydrogel and print, which is something that we want to take forward as kind of synthetic extracellular matrix mimics for cells. Um, so again, translating something that we develop for synthetic biology to actually biological questions or here really uh, inside a lipid vesicle um, where we can move on and now actually introduce stimuli response and so on and do the things that, that DNA allows us, allows us to do. Um, for the DNA nanotechnologists in the audience, I want to briefly zoom in on how this printing with DNA uh, was done. Um, so basically, first of all, the erasing, which is a bit simpler. Uh, we have these DNA-based nanostars. We have, an, we have a, 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 a linker with a nitrobenzyl group here, which can be cleaved up on irradiation with four or five nanometer. Um, and this basically gives us a way to dis dissociate the, the DNA hydrogen locally uh, with, uh, with uh, light, so to say. Um, so this is for the erasing, but then for the printing, um, we actually adapted this a design from, from this paper over here, um, where you can uh, make a hairpin structure with uh, three photocleavable sites. Um, and then basically you have an inactive linker, which you can activate up on irradiation with four or five nanometer. So basically these uh, sites here are cleaved and thereby release this, uh, this linker strand over here. So in this case, you can then form the gel up on illumination. Um, so just to show you uh, the, the two different mechanisms that we employ for printing and erasing. Yeah, what we haven't done yet is anything stimuli responsive, but that's, uh, that's for the future to, to come. And hopefully I can show you in the next talk. Um, so these were the DNA-based photoresists, which are based on this kind of uh, nanostar motif. What else can we do with, uh, with DNA nanotechnology? Well, we can make filaments. So in this case, we don't start with uh, just three DNA strands, we start with five. And these five DNA strands, um, again, have these sticky end overhangs, which allow them to polymerize. In this case, they polymerize into these filamentous structures. This is quite an old design, um, which, we, which was published already in 2014 by, by Rothman. Um, so these, uh, these DNA-based filaments are, are quite established, actually, in the, in the literature. So what did we do with them? Well, we encapsulated them inside of a lipid vesicle. Here you can see them diffusing around in a, in a GOV. Um, if you're interested in, in how we did this encapsulation, or if you, if you uh, yourself are working with GOVs or lipid vesicles, um, here's the method that we used for the encapsulation. It's in this ACS synthetic biology paper over here. It's a method that I developed in my postdoc, um, and it, it doesn't require any sort of equipment. It's really relying on the formation of a supported lipid bilayer inside of water and oil droplets, and then releasing these freestanding GOVs uh, with a decent stabilizing uh, agent. So it's really like a one pot reaction. So if you if you uh, have projects where you may struggle with encapsulation inside of GOVs, um, this may be maybe a solution. So, so check it out and really get in touch. I, I hope that this technique uh, may be useful for others as well. Um, yeah, but this brings me to the question. Um, of course, you, you may already have imagined where we would like to go with this. Um, so um, the question that we're asking is, can we use these DNA filaments to actually build up a functional cytoskeleton mimic from DNA on the inside of a lipid vesicle? 
Um, so this is this is the question, and I should say, of course, if we if we uh, want to move forward and build a functional cytoskeleton from DNA, dynamics is really key. And um, I just want to make a quick detour to to show you um, to show you why this is challenging and what we need to bear in mind um, when we want to build dynamic structures from DNA. Um, so here you can see an MD simulation of two single strands of DNA, arbitrary sequence, just two single strands. And now um, basically what you can see here is that these two single strands, one of them has a fluorophore and one of them doesn't have a fluorophore. And they behave quite differently. Um, if, you, uh, if, we, if we watch the video, you will say, see that this uh, strand with a fluorophore, it quite quickly takes on a very compact conformation. Whereas the single stranded DNA without the fluorophore, it extends every now and then, making it much more available for complementary base pairing. Um, and this, um, wait, let's, let's see, a, let's see a moment. Yeah, see, it, it, it's, it, it has, is much more likely to be found in an extended conformation compared to the fluorophore tag strand. In this case, um, this is a side three fluorophore. It's a, it's a quite hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic fluorophore, which really can, can do base stacking, but the effect also occurs for other types of fluorophores and not just fluorophores, but also, um, but also other types of DNA or RNA modifications. And we think this is very important if you start to build dynamic structures, because it can really alter the energy landscape of, of these structures. So um, we, we came across this first when we were working with a triple stranded DNA motif, uh, which is basically a pH responsive DNA motif. Um, so if you build dynamic structures, you always want them to respond to a specific stimulus. And in this case, it was pH. So basically, we have a DNA duplex here, which uh, where a single strand of DNA can wrap around um, stabilized by Huxton interactions. And then if you add a base, this triple strand becomes uh, less stable and um, basically complementary base pairing with a hairpin loop over here becomes possible. So we were working on this on this triple stranded DNA motif, and we realized that actually, depending on the fluorophore combinations that you use on these two strands, the pH switching point, as well as the steady state, can be completely altered. So you can completely destroy any dynamics in the system if you simply use the wrong fluorophore com combination. So all I want you to take away from this is that depending on the fluorophores uh, on these two strands, without looking into the details, you can either get uh, complete uh, binding between these two strands or complete uh, complete dissociation. So one of the strands sits at the periphery. So this is why we get the switching from the periphery to homogeneous distribution. So fluorophores can really make a difference. Um, so this is really a cautionary tale um, where we, uh, we looked in detail why this is the case. We looked at the dynamics with caged protons and so on to really see what is going on here. And to cut a long story short, I should really say that uh, basically what we've learned is that the choice of fluorophore can alter or completely inhibit the dynamics of uh, the, the dynamics of DNA structures. And this is, of course, important to know because we op often choose fluorophores according to our experimental setups and needs and not um, and, and uh, are or at least we are sometimes careless when switching them around. So this is really a word of caution here. Um, but if you want to phrase it positively, if you know about these effects, then you can use it to really fine tune energy landscapes of dynamic uh, DNA nanostructures. So for instance, if you want to stabilize one state versus the other, you can simply change the type of fluorophore that you use. Or if you don't want to alter it, you may think about using a different position and so on. So these dynamic DNA, where, where aesthetic DNA nanostructures are, are quite, uh, quite well established and always work, um, as, as soon as you start thinking about dynamics, the details really start to matter. Um, so, but now coming back to the DNA-based cytoskeleton. Um, so first of all, um, what kind of functions should such a DNA-based cytoskeleton have? Well, ideally it should have the same functions as a, as a natural cytoskeleton. And you uh, quickly realize that the functions of such natural cytoskeleton are quite diverse. So first of all, um, they, their assembly is triggered by ATP um, and they are stimuli responsive. They mediate intracellular cargo transport. They establish the cell shape. 
um, and they even are involved heavily in, in, in cell div division. These are just examples, but uh, I think these are four very important functions that a cytoskeleton has inside of a cell. Um, and now I should say that um, I worked a little bit also on, on, um, on natural cytoskeletal elements, so such as actin and myosin and so on. Um, and you quickly, quickly realize that the more functions you want to implement with these proteins, the, uh, the more proteins you need. And uh, unfortunately, the complexity doesn't really scale linear with the amount of, of, of components. So it becomes very, very complex very quickly. And by using DNA, I think that we can really like make inherently inherently compatible systems where we can actually quite easily uh, realize di diverse functions uh, with just with just one material so to say so let's look at it um, first of all atp triggered assembly so of course this was inspired by by um, actin filaments which uh, for instance assemble uh, once you add atp so how can we achieve this with DNA-based filaments? So what we did here was basically we uh, used these DNA tiles and on the sticky ends over here, we incorporated a split ATP optimal so that these tiles can only assemble in the presence of ATP. And you can see this over here. So um, in this, uh, in this uh, droplet, we have encapsulated the DNA tiles as well as ATP. And in the presence of ATP, the DNA filaments uh, assemble in confinement. And uh, to kind of have a, have a measure for the degree of polymerization, we're actually quantifying the porosity. And you can see here that the, the rate of assembly of the, of the um, actin filaments and the DNA filaments um, is, is quite quite comparable. Of course, one big difference is that we are not yet hydrolyzing the ATP um, for assembly. This also means that in principle, it's quite arbitrary that we choose ATP as a, as a, as a trigger for the assembly. And of course, the fact that we are using engineered components means that we can also use other stimuli to trigger the assembly. So in this case, for instance, we added an aptamer for nucleoline such that the um, DNA tiles assemble in the presence of nucleoline. And then we just added a second aptima for ATP, which in this case induced the disassembly. We can do this simply because we use engineered components. In a similar way, you can uh, use DNA strand displacement reactions where you have an invader strand which can bind to, to an overhang on the, on the DNA filament and thereby displace a DNA strand from the filament. And then you can add an anti-invader strand, which is again displacing the invading strand. And so you can really switch assembly back, uh, turn assembly on and off. Um, so far, only once. So we uh, disassemble here and then assemble again. So we thought, how can we actually, um, how can we actually reverse this even more often? Um, so here in this case, we, we thought, okay, um, we, we use again light as a trigger. We use azobenzene um, and azobenzene moiety, which can intercalate and thereby stabilize the DNA duplex in its trans state. But then upon UV illumination, we switch the azobenzene molecule to its cis state, in which case it is destabilizing the DNA duplex. Here you can really see inside of a GUV how upon UV irradiation, um, we get disassembly of the DNA filaments and then they reassemble over time. And then as you illuminate again, they disassemble again and so on and so forth. So you can really switch uh, the, the turn the filament assembly on and off uh, in multiple cycles, so to say. Yeah, so we have achieved um, some uh, stimuli responsive assembly. So what about intracellular cargo transport? Um, you probably all know this very iconic video and this is really what we are after, right? Like in this, uh, this, uh, this video of, of lipid vesicles being transported along a track of a microtubuli inside, inside living cells. So can we engineer something that, like that on our DNA-based filaments? Um, so here we had to we had to make use of a trick and and come up with a new system because obviously we cannot make use of the of the uh, of the of the mechanism that is used in nature. So we actually uh, came up with something different. Um, and we used we use DNA overhangs which can bind the cargo. Um, in this case, it can be an organic cargo like a lipid vesicle or also an inorganic cargo like a like a gold nanoparticle. And now I would like to zoom in briefly to explain the mechanism that we came up with in detail because it's uh, it's quite complex um, actually um, and 
um, we need to we need to get our hand around head around this uh, around this mechanism. So um, the mechanism that we use is the so-called burn bridge mechanism, which was first proposed in in this paper over here um, a few years ago, um, where where um, where the group of Khalid Zalaita used this to transport uh, to transport a particle on a 2D surface. So what we did basically with our DNA-based filaments was we functionalized them with a DNA-RNA chimera strand. So um, here you see uh, the DNA filament, which is first of all has a has a DNA overhang in black over here, and then we have a, a DNA RNA chimera strand, which is the DNA part is, is shown here in green, the RNA part is shown in red. Um, and so the, this uh, this strand can hybridize with the overhangs on um, on the DNA filaments. Now the cargo, in this case here a gold nanoparticle, is functionalized with a, a, a gray DNA strand, which is complemented complementary to the RNA part of the overhang. And now we add an enzyme RNAs H which can cleave only RNA in DNA-RNA hybrids. So it's basically cleaving this part over here. Um, and sorry. Um, and this means that basically the, the binding site gets, gets depleted and um, the, the, DNA, the gold nanoparticle can roll and uh, the, 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 the gray handles are not destructed in the process of that because actually it's only the, the RNA that is cleaved. So the track is depleted, but the DNA handles on the gold nanoparticle remain intact. And this means that the gold nanoparticle can roll along the filamentous track. And now in order to visualize this motion, uh, we did a trick. We actually simply um, attached biotin strip habitin, um, to this DNA overhang over here to the chimera strand. So this means the biotin strip habitin should be cleaved once the gold nanoparticle has rolled past, so to say. So we can look at this in temp, first of all, and you can see here there's a gold nanoparticle sitting on the DNA filament, and basically on the part of the filament where the gold nanoparticle has already been, um, we see the bare DNA filament, and on the part where it hasn't been yet, we still see the biotin streptavidin overhangs that sit on the, uh, on the DNA filament. Now um, we can do the same with uh, with SUVs and also in confinement. So now we use an organic cargo, which we attach in the same way. Um, we use the same type of mechanism. You can see here again in ten the lipid vesicles that attach to the to the DNA filament, or here also in stead uh, stead uh, microscopy the the red vesicles are on the yellow DNA filaments um, inside of uh, the confinement of a of a droplet. And then um, we can actually um, use again a trick to, to track the motion of these, of these lipid vesicles. I should say that, of course, we would love to track them in 3D as, they, uh, as the motion is happening inside of the droplets. Right now, we don't have a mechanism yet to do this. Um, but if, if you have ideas, I would be very, very happy to talk. Uh, right now, direct tracking is, uh, has not yet been possible so far. So this is why we, uh, we functionalize the DNA overhangs with a fluorophore. Um, and this fluorophore gets cleaved as the uh, as the SUV is rolling along the track. You can see here that basically, uh, first of all, the filaments are still labeled with the fluorophore, but as the, the vesicle is rolling along the track, the fluorophores become homogeneously distributed as they get cleaved uh, from the from the filament. And uh, the filaments afterwards are really still intact. So it's not that the filaments are destroyed. You can release them afterwards from the confinement, look at them in temp, and you see the filaments are perfectly fine. It's just the fluorophore that have come off. Um, then you can, of course, we have to do the appropriate controls where we, for instance, replace the chimera strand with just the DNA strand so the, the SUV cannot roll and so on and so forth. So we have different types of controls. They all show basically no decrease in the, in the um, filament fluorescence, whereas in the presence of the RNAs H and all the, all the correct components, uh, we get this decrease and we can use this to estimate uh, and to make an order of magnitude estimate for the transport velocity, and it's about 100 nanometer per minute, but 10 times slower than, than anything that would happen in nature. But I would say uh, it's, a, it's at least a start. And right now we are really working on this, uh, on this direct tracking of the, um, of the motion of the lipid vesicle. Yeah, um, so this is uh, intracellular cargo transport. So this brings us to the next function. Mm which is establishing the cell shape. 
So how would we do this with our DNA-based filaments? So um, we thought, okay, we have to form a cortex, right? This is how a cell would, would establish its, its shape. So we use here cholesterol tag DNA as a handle to attach the DNA filaments to the compartment periphery. And you can see here um, in this set stack that the filaments that were previously just distributed inside the lumen of the lipid vesicle are now really recruited to the periphery of the vesicle. Now, if we deflate the lipid vesicle by osmosis, um, we, um, we uh, get deformed lipid vesicles, which we believe is like almost due to pneumatic ordering of the filaments at the compartment periphery, which is why we get these straight sections of the, uh, on the GOV membrane, which, uh, which look like uh, the filaments are really lying flat on the, on the surface. So we get deformed lipid vesicles. Of course, we would love to have uh, the ability to make specific shapes. And again, this is something, something we are working on at the moment, but you see at least that what we can do already is we can attach DNA filaments to kind of form a DNA-based cortex and we get a deformation up on uh, when the filaments are adhering to the surface. What we also see is that the, really the membrane fluctuations of the GUV are, are suppressed. So deflated vesicles normally fluctuate a lot. So um, it, is, it is possible or we believe that the, the, the lipid vesicle may also be stabilized by the internal DNA cortex, so to say. Now, um, of course, um, so previously in, in one of our previous papers, we have done this from the outside. So we've added DNA origami, not DNA filaments to the outside of the lipid vesicles, um, of a lipid vesicle. Um, this was also done by others already. And uh, we've been able to sh uh, show the deformation of the lipid vesicle from the outside. But um, I think it's, it's really nice uh, to see that this also works from the inside of the lipid vesicle, because of course a, a cortex should ultimately be uh, on the inside um, of the vesicle. Yeah, now this brings me to the final point. Um, uh, of course, ultimately, a DNA-based cytoskeleton should be able to support the division of lipid vesicle uh, of lipid vesicles. And uh, if we look at this at this video here, like how cells do it, is is quite often you see the for, you see first of all the filaments get bundled, and this forms and form this contractile ring, which then contracts and basically splits up the cell into two. Now, um, I should first of all say we are not there yet. We cannot do this with a DNA-based cytoskeleton, although we'd love to, um, but I will show you where we are. Um, so as I said, the first step towards actually dividing lipid uh, or towards division with uh, a cytoskeleton is actually filament bundling, right? So uh, to engineer contractile rings, we first of all need to bundle our DNA-based filaments. And we can do this by adding a molecular crowder. As you can see here, like upon addition of a molecular crowder, we really get these thick bundles, uh, bundles forming um, out of the, the, very, um, the very small filaments. Um, and uh, if you look at that in TEM, you see that hundreds of filaments actually come together um, to form these very, very thick bundles with an increased persistence length by about a factor of almost 10, actually. Um, so, so filaments, a single filament would have a persistence length Length of about seven micron, and uh, in the presence of the of the bundlers, we get uh, the bundling agents. We get a, around thirty five micron in persistence length. Because of the very large persistence length, this means if we encapsulate now the DNA bundles inside of GOVs, um, and especially if we look at GOVs that are smaller than the persistence length of the lipid vesicles, like this one here, then we get actually the, due to the depletion effect effect and due to, due to the high persistence length, we get the formation of ring-like structures inside the, inside the GOVs. So I should clearly say that currently these rings are not closed. So this is a, this is a Z stack basically. So the, the, um, the, um, the color gives you the height um, here. And as you can clearly see, the rings are not yet closed. And there's also not yet a contraction. So we are actually quite far away from realizing a synthetic cell division with our DNA-based cytoskeletons, but it's something we are working, we are working towards at the, at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think this clearly shows that we need a shortcut because actually um, there is quite a big community also trying to encapsulate um, um, to encapsulate um, uh, proteins inside of lipid vesicles or, or actin or FDSZ rings and so on to, to mediate the division with, um, with um, just, just components that are, that are inside cells. But uh, also their um, uh, GOV division has not yet been achieved. 
So I would quickly like to show you before we finish uh, how we have achieved uh, a shortcut towards the division of synthetic cells relying on simple physical principles. So first of all, we know that the division of lipid vesicles, um, if we want to do it uh, in a simple physical way, uh, we thought, okay, what can we do? Well, first of all, we define the plane of division and we did so by phase separation actually. And then we thought, okay, we need to increase the surface to volume ratio. And we can do this by osmosis because two small compartments have a larger surface compared to their volume if you compare it to the initial uh, big one. So we did, we did this. First of all, if this is the phase separated vesicle, and if you then expose it to an osmotic pressure, because of the line tension at the domain boundary, you really get the division into two daughter compartments, which then diffuse apart. Um, because this is quite a simple process, you can actually build a geometrical model of the division, um, and this doesn't require any fitting parameters, it's really just describing the um, the um, geometry of the system and the output of this model is that it gives you predictions which you can test in experiments and i'm not going to go into detail of them, I will just show you the first one and the last one quickly. Um, so any the osmolarity ratio that is required for the vision is square root of two this simply pops out of the geometry of the system. You can then prepare buffer solutions of different osmolarities and you find that at square root of two we get division. Um, you get you can define a division parameter, which is basically uh, giving you the progression of the division process, and you can see that the experimental data fits the theoretical prediction quite well. We, you also realize that we've built an osmolarity sensor, which is compatible with cell culture, because from the shape of the lipid vesicle, we know which osmolarity the buffer has to have. Uh, so we can really use this as an osmolarity sensor in, in cell culture. Um, yeah, and then finally, um, any process which is increasing the osmolarity should be suitable to trigger division. So this could be um, breaking up sugars with an with an uh, enzyme, or this could be using photocleavable compounds and basically um, increasing the osmolarity by by breaking up components with with light. Um, and you can see here that after about 20 minutes, in the case of the enzymatic reaction, we reach an osmolarity ratio of square root of two, and this is also kind of the time when when the vesicles indeed divide here due to the metabolic reaction that is that is happening. Um, and then after division, of course, you need a mechanism for for regrowth because we make use of phase separation, so we need a way to grow phase separation back. Um, and again, we used our favorite tool DNA nanotechnology um, to really uh, to really tether lipids of the opposite lipid type so that we can basically fuse uh, small vesicles to a big one after the division process. And of course, this is a little bit of a cheat, right? Because we're feeding lipids. Of course, it would be much nicer to be able to make them inside of the synthetic cell. But again, it's just a shortcut for now to be, to be able to move on to do, uh, to do the interesting things that you can do once, once you have a mechanism for division and, and, and regrowth. And I should say, we believe that this is a way to go towards multiple growth and division cycles, although we haven't demonstrated it yet or done this yet. Um, you can also actually divide single phase GOVs by, by increasing the spontaneous curvature with a, um, with a lipid oxidation. So we have here used the reactive oxygen species, which allows you to actually uh, get lipid oxidation um, and then uh, increase the uh, surface area of the outer leaflet selectively. And in this way, you can also divide single phase lipid vesicles in case you need this. Um, so right now, um, what we what we uh, what we uh, have done with this is uh, we have encapsulated DNA uh, inside of the dividing lipid vesicles. Um, so so basically, this this brings me to the question: What's next? So obviously, what's next is, is the integration of information storage, and what we need now is basically a link between the information and the phenotype or the characteristics of the synthetic cell, because if you think about it, evolution can only act on the phenotype. So what you really need is a link between the information and the characteristics of the synthetic cell. And if you think about the deformed lipid vesicles that I've shown you, um, then you may get an idea um, of what we have in mind to kind of link information and, and characteristics of the lipid vesicles. Yeah, and this uh, brings me to my conclusion. I, I've shown you one tool, uh, laser printing as kind of the latest addition to the toolbox that uh, we, we find useful for making synthetic cells and DNA nanotechnology. And finally, I've shown you uh, 
well, kind of a, a shortcut to a function that uh, that may seem crucial towards uh, towards making synthetic cells. Um, and um, of course, when are we there? I don't know, um, but I'd be I'd be very very happy to this to discuss. And I think that sometimes, if you're open to to use new tools and new, new materials, this may be actually quicker. That we may be quicker at arriving at the end goal. Yeah, um, I should say thank you to, to my group. You see them here. Uh, we went wakeboarding about two weeks ago, um, and also thanks to our to our collaborators, um, especially Laura Naliu and Peng Fei San worked on the DNA filaments with us, um, which was work done by Kevin, um, and then the division story, which is mainly done by Yannick. Um, so yeah, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Kirsten. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, we, if anyone has any other questions they'd like to ask, then please um, carry on adding them to Slido. We've got about 10 minutes, so we can hopefully get through a lot of them. Um, Steve, I don't know, do, do you want to kick things off in terms of questions? Okay, yes, I mean, I, yeah, I've not managed to <laughs> look at the Slido yet, but I would had a couple of general questions, uh, Kirsten. One, one was that, obviously, in each example you showed us that confinement, uh, these are processes, DNA-based processes, within, within confined spaces. Now, is there anything special about confinement? Um, you know, does it change the dynamics of the components or, or their reactivity, or, or is it just a representation of the bulk in a very small, but in a very small volume? Yeah, um, that's, that's an interesting question, right? Like what is, what is, uh, what is the, the role of confinement in, in these processes? I mean, um, so, so um, first of all, I think that right. So it change. I would say it changes the details, right? It it doesn't change. It doesn't change anything. Um, so so for instance, if we look at the transport, the transport can be done in bulk, and the transport can be uh, can be uh, done in confinement. And since anyway, transport is confined to the to the to the DNA filament, so to say, actually it, it, it doesn't change much. What we see, for instance, is that the DNA filaments assemble quicker inside, inside confinement, um, which, is, which is likely just, uh, just, um, just because of the fact that, that basically the, the components are, are, cannot diffuse out and are, um, well, are confined to a very small volume. Um, I mean, I would say that the type of confinement that we that we use right now, like lipid vesicles, um, are are nice in the sense that they give us a way to translate everything we do, ultimately also to living cells. So actually, this is one of the main reasons for me to to stick to the lipid vesicles. That basically it's quite a nice uh, a nice test system to also make components which we can directly translate to living cells. Other than that, if we think in a completely synthetic biology way, I think yeah, I mean uh, I would be open to use something something mm -hmm. else as well. Um, Right. Can I ask another question, Tom? Uh, yeah. you, uh, have you got the Slido sorted out? You... Go, go. I, I, I'm getting through it, but yeah, go, go, go ahead. I'll just ask one more and then you could move over to, this, to our colleagues' questions. I mean, um, I mean, again, in every case, you use isometric system, confinements, so spherical vesicles. I mean, it seems to me one of the key features of trying to, in the end, sort of replicate or represent a living system is breaking the symmetry of, mm -hmm. of uh, not only morphologically, but of course, in terms of the functionality and the, and the chemical gradients and so on. I mean, have you developed methods or can you conceive of methods for, you know, working with anisotropic uh, GUVs, for example? Yeah, I mean, I would say that these Janus type GUV, uh, GUVs with the with the two halves, right? They are kind of examples of that a little bit. So you could imagine that, for instance, like one of the phases, which is the liquid ordered phase, the other phase is liquid disordered. So um, I could well imagine, or I mean, it's 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 known uh, in some cases that their permea permeability, for instance, for for certain components is is different, and maybe this gives us handles to actually um, to actually. I completely agree with you, right? Like this uh, this. Uh, actually breaking the symmetry is 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 absolutely crucial for for um for many processes um and this is also precisely the reason why um we want to move away from these only spherical vesicles right so int introduce deformations and ideally not just like random deformations but really like 
go away from just spherical spherical shapes right and in most cases when we when we see work on govs it's always it's always spher mm -hmm. spherical govs but this doesn't have to be right we can we can move away and and make more interesting more interesting shapes and and thereby also break the symmetry um mm -hmm. it's right. it's important yeah <laughs> Okay, Tom, did you want to take some questions? Yeah, yeah so I've got I've, the, the one at the top of the slide there is, is quite philosophical. So it says, do you believe the complexity of life can be understood faster in a reductionist manner, such as bottom-up synthetic biology? Could you expand upon that vision? Yeah, I mean, so, okay, I come, I come from a physics background, right? So um, for, me, for me to understand something is absolutely crucial to have a model and to have a model of which we can understand all the parts individually in the, in the first instance. And I think this is what motivates many of us to do this kind of research that we say we want to get to a system that we can, that we can actually fully understand and build from the bottom up. Um, I mean, I, I think ultimately it's, it, ultimately the answer is, or, it's 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 a question about where do you want to get right like what is your end goal i think uh, if you say my end goal is to be to produce molecule x right um and that, then you may be quicker at actually engineering a cell to do it and produce molecule x right like this is this is where top-down synthetic biology has been has been quite successful and and um so so um if it, for, for certain things, you don't need to understand every aspect of the system to, to make it work for what you want to make it work, uh, for, for what you want to use it for, right? So um, I wouldn't say it's the, it's a, this approach is the holy grail. Like, I mean, my motivation is really to, um, to understand if it's possible to use molecular components to build something which behaves like like a living cell so something which is capable of self-replication and evolution say divides 20 times or 50 times and grows and and uh, basically you start with a population that's different from the population that you have in the end so you can kind of see ev evolution ultimately evolution of also greater complexities so something in the sense of open-ended evolution inside a synthetic system that you have really built from the bottom up so that's that's really my motivation to do this is pure curiosity um, and um, I would say that applications branch out right like in the case of the osmolarity sensors or so they are not they are not my my, my primary aim but this doesn't mean that um, I mean other systems where you say okay you want to decipher the function of a certain protein or so um, of course uh, of course you may approach this uh, approach things completely different I have the feeling that even within the field of synthetic biologies biology there are people who are motivated uh, to ask to understand biology as it is um, and then there are people who are who just want to engineer biology and then there are people who want to understand the origins of life right like so the, the, the motivations are, are quite diverse and therefore also the tools are diverse and i would say that's good um yeah no also i think curiosity is a I think is a, is underrated in science. We should we should we shouldn't we shouldn't undervalue that in a way. It's good to just follow follow your own heart in a way. Sometimes I don't know, Steve. Do you have an, another question from the slide out? Oops, sorry, you're, you're muted, Steve. Oops, Steve, you're uh, muted. <laughs> I wasted all my breath. There, didn't I? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, quite a, few, a couple of interesting uh, technical questions. For example, somebody asks, you know, are the processes with DNA reversible? I mean, you know, and if not, what is currently lacking for the sort of sustained sense responsive type behaviors in these systems? Yeah, so I would say the closest we got to um, to true reversibility is here in this case of in the case of the azobenzene system, where we can really like assemble, disassemble, assemble, disassemble in 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 many cycles. Um, in fact, yeah, you may you may mm. see that there's a little bit of fatigue, maybe maybe towards the end. Um, we are not sure what the what the reason for this is. It could be a bit of UV damage, although we tested for that and we don't think it's the case. Um, so um, actually. 
one thing that we think is happening is definitely bleaching, which is which is an is issue. So um, I would say for for true reversibility in the case of other benzene, for instance, it, it would be really cool to move towards other benzene other benzene variants, which are more in the redshifted uh, redshifted region, so that we don't have so much uh, that we don't have to use this uh, this high energy, so to say. Um, and there are variants out there right now. Um, so I would say using light as the trigger is one of the most promising ways to get towards true reversibility. And um, also in case of the pH responsive systems that we have for DNA nanotechnology, like um, the triplex motives, those are also those are also in many cases truly uh, reversible um, in the sense that you can you can switch them back and forth. Anything that uses like kind of invader or strand displacement reactions or so is is I would say quite hard to go to get towards true reversibility. So I would say the challenge, what is the challenge? It's really fine-tuning the energy landscape so that, that true reversibility um, is, is feasible, right? And then providing the stimulus, right? In many cases, this is the issue where, where with light, we can circumvent it. You can just illuminate the sample and that's fine. But oftentimes, if you need to flush it or add a reagent or so, uh, the observation simply becomes difficult, right? And this makes true reversibility at some point just experimentally extremely challenging to observe. Um, okay, that's good. So, so some other questions here about pore formation on the uh, 3D laser printing. So somebody, colleague asks, can you explain in a little bit more detail the chemical processes of pore formation um, in the 3D laser printing technique? And is there an explanation for why the pore is so elongated? So that's one question. And another one was, what sort of resolution do you get in the laser mm -hmm. printing and how small can you potentially go? Yeah. Um, so why is the pore elongated? This can be answered quite, quite quickly. It's simply because we printed an elongated pore um, in order to be able to visualize it easily. So I mean, this is, this is the beauty of 3D laser printing that you can basically make, that you have full control over the shape that you, that you make. Um, so so this, is simply, this is simply what we printed. We printed a cylinder um, or, uh, yeah, um, this, is, this is how we printed it. The mechanism of pore formation, so actually, I, I should say that the fact that we started this happened by chance. So, you know, when you when you do the experiment and you print inside the vesicle, at some point you by accident hit the membrane if you do it many times. And we at first thought this would damage the vesicle, but we realized, no, it's actually possible and the vesicle remains stable. Um, we think what is going on, and this is more a hypothesis as a, than a fully confirmed um, statement, is that basically, um, if we print close to the membrane, we are actually uh, generating free radicals close to the membrane, which could cause lipid, li lipid oxidation at this spot. And lipid oxidation is known to induce local pore formation. And this may actually provide a mechanism to locally create a membrane defect into which the resist can then polymerize and thereby push the membrane away and kind of create the space to actually print the pore. So we think that this is what is what is uh, what is likely to be going on uh, to be going on here, but we don't have the final final confirmation for this yet. And um, with respect to the resolution, um, so so far everything we did is uh, is really proof of principle. We get down to resolutions of about um, of about um, one to two micron. Um, so so this can this is mainly limited at the moment by the resist. Um, mm -hmm. So by going to, to, to better resists and by uh, really also tuning the resist concentrations, tuning the writing speed, tuning the laser power, and so on and so forth, um, one can get down. And I mean, laser writing 3D, uh, two photon 3D laser printing is quite established, and people get down to resolutions in the in the nanometer range. Mm -hmm. um, so it is in principle in principle possible um, to to go lower, um, but this really requires a careful thought on the resists mainly. Great. Tom, did you pick well, out, I, pick out I, any I questions I, yourself? Well, I realize we're now, we're now at two o'clock. So if anyone needs to leave, then oh, okay. I, wanted to th I really want to thank Kirsten again, and obviously you, Steve, as well, for, for managing the questions and things. I'm happy to stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes, if that's okay, Kirsten, just we can get through a few. Yeah, yeah definitely, questions. definitely. Yeah, there's quite a lot of good questions. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone else needs to leave, then, then feel free to go. Um, so I'm just trying to link. Yeah. So one of the, this is one of the questions that actually came to my mind as well was, 
So you're, you're using obviously DNA to build these cytoskeletons. And I was just wondering, obviously we don't, as far as I know, we don't see DNA cytoskeletons in nature. I'm just wondering what, what you see as the biggest advantages and disadvantages of using DNA rather than say protein or something. Yeah. Like building these things. Yeah, so I mean, I think conceptually that's quite interesting, right? Like nature has chosen to use um, to use a different type of material for information storage and structure, like the DNA versus proteins. And we now actually can kind of do, do uh, the opposite and say, okay, we uh, we use DNA as kind of the information storage medium also for structure. So conceptually, that's that's. Uh, really kind of curious or, or in, intriguing I think to, to say okay let's let's build with DNA and um, what it made it the advantage that I see is that basically you build systems that are inherently compatible so, so in so basically I mean um, if you if you want to realize transport uh, deformation um, division um, maybe a stimuli responsive assembly if you want to realize all of these with like protein based components then you realize that one protein or one type of protein is not enough you need to use different proteins a lot of proteins and they like different conditions and so on so it actually gets quite challenging plus i think it's somehow nice to say okay can we really engineer it from scratch in the sense that I mean, just, you know, like make our, really make our own materials. Um, then we also understand what, what is the essence that, that we really need, right? Um, so, so this for me is, is another reason to do it. Ultimately, um, I think it will be very interesting to move to RNA-based architectures because then you can transcribe them also inside living cells or, or inside synthetic cells. So then that gives us a handle to genetically encode these systems. And I think this is, this is really the direction forward when it comes to when it comes to DNA nanotechnology and or RNA nanotechnology. Then, um, and I mean, I would say like right now, protein engineering is, has really progressed very very fast. I was really intrigued to see this, and I think if I did a post on that, I would do it in protein engineering. <laughs> this comes from me, right? Um, as um, so I think there's cool new opportunities arising and especially also in the combination of, of protein engineering and, and DNA nanotechnology, right? Um, so um, I would say, you know, we go with what works, right? Like at the moment, DNA nanotechnology just makes it easy to build things that you like on the nanoscale. But I could well imagine that in a few years, um, we'll be at the same point with protein engineering. And then, you know, you, 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 there's no reason to be dogmatic about what we do, right? You can constantly scan the horizon and look for new tools, new materials as they become useful. Um, and yeah, I think, I think um, in that sense, yeah, once we, we may switch, but first we switch to RNA and then to protein. Yeah. In, in, that, in, that, in that context, Kirsten, there's a couple of questions from from Deck Wilson, um, who is a protein engineer and does you know, amazing things with the kind of programming of, of um, short sort of peptides, uh, peptides effectively. And, and Deck asks, says, Kirsten, great talk, thank you. Do your three-way DNA blocks form hexagonal lattices as well as hydrogels? Are more regular lattices more likely? So that was a, that's kind of the work that Dex's been doing with with these peptides. Um, yeah. Um, so, so basically, this depends on the details. So these uh, these three arm DNA motifs they have been um, they have been engineered in, in in quite a few a few different ways. So people have played around with this um, with this a lot. So in this case, we basically if we want to form three D structures, right? We we deliberately introduce flexibility, for instance, here in the junction. Mm -hmm. um, so so, but if you want to really make hexagonal lattices. Then, in many cases, actually, the the you need to make sure that the arms are, are basically stiff enough, and uh, you may also want to grow them on a two D surface. Um, if you do that, like uh, for instance, there there are variants of this design where we have two DNA duplexes running in parallel, which already gives a bit of introduces a bit of stiffness. Then you can definitely form hexagonal two D lattices from from DNA based motifs. Um, so so it is possible. Um, it has been, it has right. been right, and then related to that, Deck also asks about you, the fact that you mentioned Z rings. Um, presumably, you he, he asks, presumably, you will have to locate your fibers to specific regions of the GUV 
you know, like uh, Fitz, Fitzy said, or Min in um, E. coli, how will you do this? How will you make those attachments and spatial positioning of the system? Yeah, and I mean, so so I have several thoughts on this. So so first of all, I mean, if you look at the vesicle like this, right? then you kind of at the domain boundary, you're defining a, spe a specific location, right? Mm -hmm. So I could, for instance, imagine that you, there, there are certain moieties or certain DNA tags which self-assemble preferably into the liquid ordered phase and others that self-assemble preferably in, into the liquid disordered phase. So if you kind of base pair something here, I could imagine that you can kind of tag the ring at the center with, with a component. Um, I'm not sure if this is if this is necessary, or if you could also say deflate the vesicle or shape it in a certain way that simply due to persistence length and physical effects, you can get positioning. Um, so this is something that we'll, we'll have to see. Um, I would hope that that uh, you can make it work. Um, basically relying on, uh, on on breaking the symmetry first by deflation and actually changing the, the shape of the GOV and going away from a spherical shape in, in mm -hmm. the first place. Um, but as I said, this is this is something for the future and I'm just speculating, I have no idea. Um, yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, you need that differences in radi radii of curvature and lipid and the packing parameter of the lipids to be able to sort of at least differentiate different positions, I guess. Um, I mean, there are actually, it's, I, mean, I don't know if it's lipids, but my cells certainly can face separate very well into, into I think they're called bicells. So these are rather dislike um, uh, microstructures um, with, with you know, two different lipids, one segregating or par partitioning out on the edge of the pancake, if you like, and the other one sitting on the, on the top and bottom of the disc um, because, because they fit the curvature and things like that. So. I mean, so you know, spontaneous phase separation of lipids, you know, works quite well on the micelle level. I don't know. I mean, you, as you show on this slide, it kind of works. It works in a kind of Janus type way. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I think so. I think we're kind of we're at the end of the questions now. So again, I just want to yeah, thank you, Kirsten, for an awesome talk uh, this afternoon. It was really interesting. All the different things you can do with vesicles and DNA and all sorts of other things that uh, molecular components. Now, I've got a couple of questions that we ask all of the seminar speakers that are a bit broader kind of informal questions. Um, and the first one I ask everyone is kind of what got you started in science and how did you end up in synthetic biology as a field? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, I guess. Um, I was always intrigued by the questions, even as a child, that my parents couldn't answer, right? So it's really the big questions like, what is life and could it be different and so on. So these questions always fascinated me. Um, I, then, I then studied actually physics and molecular medicine um, and um, ended up working on, on DNA nanopores, um, which, which we used for sensing applications. So it was always like using new tools to, to study biological questions. And then these DNA nanopores um, were, were, were used as sensors, but for me, they were always components of synthetic cells. So I thought, okay, can we actually use them to, to, to build up, a, if we can build up a nanopore, right? Can we, if, if we can build up something that looks like a protein pore, can we build up an entire cell? And I, I always thought that's, that's a dream. Um, but then I, I, I realized that there's actually a scientific field that is, that is trying to do precisely that. And that's bottom up synthetic biology. Um, and this I realized uh, only, well, in the middle of my PhD or so. <laughs> and so it was quite clear that, that this is the field I would like to go into. Um, and yeah, I think it's exciting to be at the time where, you know, this question, which was long, long asked by philosophers and so on, is, is now in the realm of science, can now be addressed by us as scientists. So we can start to, to actually build something which, uh, which looks like a cell and, and behaves like a cell. I think that's, that's quite cool. Um, yeah, no, it's, it is amazing. And I think well, it's, it's, you probably came in at the right time as well in terms of sort of things were just becoming possible like uh, there's a certain amount of inherent knowledge you need before you can do really interesting stuff and we're I think at that kind of kind of transitionary period I think in a lot of areas of exactly. biology, yeah so yeah <laughs> so do you think so one of the sort of related to that do you think there are any specific hurdles if it does something that say you say you had a genie and you and you could mm. basically ask him to solve one thing for you 
Is there something in your day-to-day -day research that's always a hurdle and that still needs to be overcome to really kind of make yeah. the idea of a synthetic cell a, a reality? Or, or do you think we have all of the components you're just not quite sure yet how to put them together? So, okay, let me let me answer in a bit of more philosophical uh, philo philosophical sense, not in a day-to-day -day lab uh, lab point, because I think that there are definitely challenges that we have to address on a day-to-day -day, uh, lab basis. But I think really what what the field needs right now is a clear definition of the end goal. So, I mean, right now, okay. Um, I feel like there are different motivations to work on synthetic cells. So one may be to understand the origins of life, uh, to understand biology as it is, or to engineer biology as it has never been, right? Um, and I think for, for me, it's really the latter. It's like, can we engineer biology as it has never been? Can we engineer a living cell from scratch? But then you need to define what is a living cell. When have you reached the goal? Otherwise, people, if you don't have a defined goal, you cannot work towards it. Um, and I think now the field really needs to agree on what is the end goal and when, how do we know when we have achieved it, right? Yeah. And I would say something like maybe have a system which can self-regenerate, so self-replicate and evolve and do this 50 times or something like this um, can be a, a, a good working definition. Um, and at least for me, it's like what I'm now running towards, right? Like, um, I, I think that's, that's the main thing that's missing, right? Really a coherent aim. Um, and so for you then, the key thing is this ability to kind of self-replicate, make more of yourself than propagate in some sense. Is that kind of one of the key things from your perspective that we're lacking at the moment? We don't have the, the, the kind of examples of that actually happening. Yeah, I mean, so, so self-replication, I would say yes, it's the key is a key element if you understand self-replication broadly. I mean, self-replication, not just in the sense of dividing a compartment or dividing a genome or something like that, but also self-regeneration, like actually making the parts that you need from that for that as well. And of course, you may say, okay, life cannot happen in the vacuum, right? Life, life is always happening in an environment. And this also means that you that it's okay to take up things from the environment. But then this raises the question, how much, right? What, what are you allow, allowed to add to your system in order for it to self, the, you know, where you can still say, okay, it's still self-regenerating, self-replicating, uh, reproducing, and, and somehow evolving. Um, yeah, no, I think that's that's a good distinction there because we even if you look at natural organisms, there are some that can only live in a very specialized niche where they perhaps get yeah. almost all of their amino acids from the environment. They don't actually synthesize them from scratch. So it's it's a, a spectrum, but I completely agree with you. I think there's a it's there's a lot of um uncertainty around where things wait like yeah. so what you're actually trying yeah. to do at the end of the day which is all about the question it boils down to the question what is life right um but we need <laughs> and i don't think there's one there's one answer right but we need at least a working definition for the field um to yeah, to... yeah definitely no it's, it's, it's really important i think um another question that i think is kind of important is it also show us a little bit about your view on what synthetic biology is, is how do you think synthetic biology is going to actually impact our lives in, say, 10 or 50 years' time? How is the world going to be different to how it is mm -hmm. now? So here I would like to make a, make a point um, that, I, that I think is important. Like when we talk about applications of synthetic biology, we often think about applying synthetic cells for something, right? Quite often something that comes up is medicine, right? Like uh, what can a synthetic cell do inside, inside a well, human, human, human body, for instance, right? Can we use them kind of as cellular robots to, I don't know, uh, uh, cure a disease or something like that, right? Um, I think that's a fundamentally different question because in many of these applications, you don't want self-replication, right? It's the last thing you want that something that you put in the body is just self-replicating as it likes, right? Like, I mean, I think that's quite a quite a different aim actually to make uh, to make kind of a, a cellular robot which which you can use for drug delivery or so like kind of a, a sophisticated liposomal drug delivery system or so is uh, is um, of course it offers exciting prospects and I think uh, in, in 10 to 15 years I mean liposomal drug delivery is already on the market right so um, 
and making this more sophisticated is is exciting um but i would really like go away from this and now now talk about the the synthetic cell uh synthetic cell angle as i see it and i think here um we we should really think about the fact that what we need to develop synthetic cells is uh is tools right so we are really developing new technologies new materials to make synthetic cells and these new tools and new materials can easily be branched out so um for instance, when we developed this mechanism for, for synthetic cell division, we realized that, ah, actually we've built an osmolarity sensor, right? Whereas normal osmolarity sensors require freezing of the sample. So maybe we have something which can work in the future in cell culture. And I think exploiting the things that the tools and the technologies that you develop along the way, A, means that we don't have to wait 50 years as you just suggested that we have something already right now or that we constantly have output that can be used um, but it also means that we can free ourselves and really go for the curiosity driven vision of of of, of building a synthetic cell and it doesn't have to be immediately applied uh, for something and I mean, if you think about actually applying the truly synthetic cell in the sense of a self-regenerating synthetic cell, I can only imagine it in a, in a material sense, right, where you can make use of the self-replication aspect. So I don't know, grow synthetic cells like uh, that, that make architectures or whatever, like on a, on a larger scale, where you actually use the fact that you are, you're, you're uh, self-replicating uh, something. Um, yeah, I, I, don't I was know. I was also wondering, like, because you're a physicist by training, so um, and obviously there's all these like missions to Mars and things like that, and I'm always kind of in, intrigued in the fact that if we can potentially make new forms of life, would be very different forms from what you see on Earth, whether that would be useful to I don't know, sort of seed other planets or other environments where like normal biological life from our perspective it doesn't work anymore and perhaps there are the physics of what you're working with is more akin to actually being effective in these sorts of environments but maybe that's a bit far-fetched <laughs> yeah i mean that's idea. interesting i mean it's actually it's actually quite interesting to see that there is also an engineering community who is trying to engineer <laughs> self-replicating machines yeah. and they go for exactly these kind of applications to say okay in an environment where we can't just make a second machine right where we yeah. can't just build a second machine can we actually make a machine which can regenerate or re replicate itself um so there's an entire field actually engineering uh well se self-replicating machines and i almost yeah i mean i almost i i see very close links right when in what we are trying to do just a little bit on a different scale um and and with different materials and so on um and i mean i would say in the in uh, concerning different environments i mean of course if you design 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 something from scratch you can build features in which allow the systems to survive other environments or so also like for instance toxins right like components that you cannot produce. Like if you look at the limitations of, of uh, top-down synthetic biology, you may say, okay, one limitation is that actually, as soon as you make a component that is toxic to a living cell, then it's not really doable anymore. So um, of course with, uh, with a synthetic biology, maybe this, this could, be, could be feasible, right? So um, yeah, I, I would say that, uh, that this could definitely be an interesting direction, although um, we are not focusing on it so much at the moment because this means you lose the possibility to branch out what you have you've created for synthetic cells towards living cells, right? And I think it's quite nice to have this to have this transfer from components that we build for synthetic cells to then employ them um, towards address uh, questions in, in biology so that the fields can kind of benefit from one another. I think that's that's quite nice, and uh, this of course you may lose if you go towards like. <laughs> Crazy conditions. Exactly. No, it's very, very true. Um, so my last question then is it's a very general one. It's about and any sort of like you've obviously your career, you've you've worked in different areas and different countries and all sorts of different things. And would, would you have any advice for say a student that's starting out and thinking that, well, oh, I want to become a researcher? Are there any sort of like sort of like gems that you you were so i wish i'd known this when i started out no one told me about this um for kind of the next generation of scientists that's maybe watching this yeah i think it's 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 of course it's of course many things but i think um 
what what I think is very very important is that you find environments that you really enjoy working in, so that you that you find an environment where you feel supported, where you feel like your ideas matter, and where you feel like you can really do what you what you like to do, and you you know you enjoy your time um, in in science in the lab and outside the lab and so on. So I feel like these are. I've been very fortunate to be in, in environments like this that have been very, very, very supportive. And you know, this just this just makes the whole makes makes it a lot of fun, right? To work to work in these environments if you're surrounded by people who are just as motivated to do things as as you are. Um, and um, maybe as a second second piece of advice is what what really sparked what really helps to spark creativity is to move from one place to another I, I i know people always say this but i think it's i think it's really true that if after your phd for instance you've learned one thing and you, then you go and take these skills and take them to a different setting and apply them to a different field this is where new things have to emerge right you you bring two things together that 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 haven't been brought together so far and and this is really really powerful and i underestimated it myself um when when i transitioned from from phd to postdoc like how how many new ideas you get once you have been deeply into one field and then go deeply into another field um i and it's uh, it, it's 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 really true what people say. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, I think that's good advice. A lot of people have said, we've, we've asked other kind of researchers, and one of them that always comes up is finding the right people or groups or areas that you really like passionate. Yeah. Um, and I think what you're saying about working, well, not being afraid, I guess, to make a change, like it, sometimes it can be a bit daunting, but it's... it's yeah, yeah. Like, you have and to do out it. of the comfort zone is when new things happen, right? Like this is it's, it's really, really crazy, really nice. To see. And I have to say, this whole synthetic biology field is one of these fields that I feel is extremely collaborative, extremely friendly. Maybe because we are not after deciphering the one pathway, right? We're just after like building a cell, right? And I, I don't think, yeah, you know, it's such a complex task that nobody is taking anything away from, from somebody else because we, well, there's enough to do anyway. <laughs> So um, I feel like it's been an, it's a very collaborative and friendly field to, to be in. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Kirsten, for a wonderful talk and some really nice insight in, in those questions into kind of your approaches and things that you've learned that work well and all the rest of it. And um, I can't wait to read some more of your research soon. So thanks again. <laughs> Thank you.